To me, it always feels like our peace, our peace of mind, it feels like to me it is always under attack. I don't know if you all will agree with me on that, but it feels like our peace is always under attack. If it is not something that is personally attacking us, there's something going on around us that it feels like is attacking our peace of mind. Mm -hmm. Life, I often feel, it is always doing its very best to knock us out, to knock us flat on our back, or to knock us face first into the ground. Again, I don't know if it's just maybe me that feels this way, but I feel like life is trying to do its best to destroy me. And maybe you feel like it is doing its best to destroy you today. Yet I tell you that again, we are still standing strong. And I tell you today that we must have the resilience to keep standing strong in this fight that life is putting up, it seems, again to me, against all of us. Well. All the last month, you recall that I preached about living for the better. I said that we should turn to God, that we should choose God on every over everything, if we desire to live for the better. And if we turn to him, Christ said it himself, that he will take away our burdens and that he will give us rest in our soul. Yet as we see Paul say here in my key verse for today, we are hard pressed, we are perplexed, we are persecuted, and we are struck down on every side. Seemingly any direction that we turn in, wherever it seems we go, it seems like struggle, it seems like trouble, it seems like problems are everywhere in our life. What are we to do about this? when trouble is everywhere we turn. Now, Paul, he was a man that would agree with all of us when it comes to feeling like trouble is on every side. Paul, he would agree to, with us when we would say, hey, my peace feels like it is under attack today. You see, as a servant of the Lord, Paul was not one to hide the fact that our enemy is always doing its best to attack our peace. So Paul, again, was one who could testify of the fact that on his three missionary journeys, that he had a lot of conflict that he had to face. There was a lot of opposition that he had to face while trying to simply share the good news of the gospel of Christ. You see, Paul's journeys, they were incredibly difficult. Again, as he was met with much opposition everywhere he went for simply trying to do what was good, for simply trying to carry out the commission that he had been tasked with by Christ. Paul, he first met opposition from the Jews who believed as he once did. See, Paul, he once believed that the preaching of Christ was against the law, and therefore the preaching of Christ, it was against the Lord. So those Jews, they made it their mission to antagonize Paul. They made it their mission to contradict Paul in his preaching and in his teaching of the good news of Christ. Paul, he was kicked out of synagogue. Paul, he was dragged out of cities. Paul was even nearly stoned to death. And for what? For living his life 
And again, trying to preach and to teach, to let somebody know about the good news of Christ. And again, if that was not enough, Paul, he faced angry mobs that had him arrested again because he dared teach and preach and to live his life in the way of Christ. He faced problems because of who he was. So again, when Paul speaks about being persecuted there to the Corinthians, when he spoke about being struck down there, we should again understand that this was a man that was simply letting somebody know about his own experiences in life. Paul felt like life was after him. Paul felt like the world was after him. See, Paul, he was a man that was hated. He was a man that was persecuted, a man that was pursued everywhere he went. Again, simply because he was carrying out the Great Commission. But again, that's life, isn't it? Life is a whole lot like that. When we're merely trying to live our lives, it seems like, again, our peace is under attack. See, I don't think many of us have to imagine what it was like for Paul, because I believe many of us, we have an understanding of what it's like to be persecuted everywhere we turn and everywhere we go. You see, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the month that we are now in. February. Shortest month of the year that they decided would be Black History Month. I would be remiss if I again did not acknowledge our past. And again, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge our present. Again, we have had it rough in our past, and we still have it rough today. Not just because of who we believe in, but because of who we are, as my mom just said before I did. You know, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't acknowledge what happened in Memphis a couple of weeks ago. Because again, of, of who one was. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge what has, has happened in recent years. Again, because of who we are. We again are people who have had it rough in our life. Everywhere we turn, problems seems to exist. Troubles seems to be there. Struggles seem to be in our way. What are we to do about this? Not only do we have it rough because of who we are, but for some of us, bills continue to stack up on the counter or on the table. And that again, that's rough for a lot of us. Not being able to afford new things. That again, that's rough for a lot of us being worried about illness and not being able to take care of ourselves because of illness, that again, it is rough for a lot of us. Again, worrying about not being able to put food on the table is a problem. It is a struggle. And again, that is a rough for a lot of us. But I want you to hear something today that we share something in common with Paul today. What we share in common with Paul today is that when Paul was in trouble, he was still standing. We are in trouble. We, again, everywhere we turn, there is struggle. There is heartache. There is pain. There is, as we saw in our Sunday school lesson today, trials and tribulation, but we are still standing strong. We are still here today. I will tell you today that we, that you are resilient. Do you hear that there today? You are resilient. 
you are still standing strong with trouble on every side. Again, in our key verse, look at what Paul said there. Paul, in our key verse there, the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, he makes a, a very dramatic comparison there in the eighth and in the ninth verse there. He, he said to the Corinthians there, he said that we are hard pressed, that we are troubled on every side, but, and yet, we are not crushed, is what Paul said. Paul, he again said there that we are perplexed, we are stunned, we are confused by all that is going on around us on every side, but, and yet, we are not in despair. Paul said that we are persecuted, that we are pursued on every side, but, and yet, Paul said, we are not forsaken, we are not abandoned. We are not left alone. Paul says there. Paul, he then said that we are struck down on every side, but, and yet we, Paul said, are not destroyed. Are you destroyed today? Have you been crushed today? I heard a nope. Andrew is shaking his head. You see, Paul, he was saying to the Corinthians and he's saying to all of us today, he's saying that it's an impossibility for us to even be here today. Paul was saying that we should not be standing today, but we are still standing. Paul, he, he, he says there, again, if you think about this for a moment, if, if, if someone is hard pressed, if they have been pressed down on every side, Paul is saying there, if you think about it, they should have crumpled a long time ago. They should have been destroyed a, a longer time ago. If you were being pressed down on every side, you shouldn't be here today. But I see all of you today. You still, I mean, you're sitting right now, but you're standing. Think about it for a moment. Someone that is confused by everything that is going on around them. Everywhere they're turned, they are just stunned and perplexed. They should be lost. Should know which way to go. Yet a way is made for us, isn't it? We aren't lost, are we? Again, think about this for a moment. Being persecuted. Pursued everywhere you go. Being struck down everywhere you go. Eventually you should get exhausted. Eventually it should just wear you out. But are you exhausted today? And are you worn out? Mom said, I'm still going. Are you still going today? I'm still going. So the question that one may ask is how? How are you still going? How are you still making it? How are you still standing strong today? Again, I tell you today that we are still standing, standing strong because as Paul makes it very clear to us, we are resilient. We are resilient creatures. We should have been defeated a long time ago, but we aren't defeated. We are still standing strong today. You see, in our resilience, I want you to hear today, you cannot be beaten. You cannot be defeated. You are unbeatable in your resilience today. You see, to be resilient is to have the capability to withstand. It is the ability to recover quickly from difficulties, from problems, from struggle, from trials, from tribulation, you have recovered. I know you have recovered because here you are today. Here I am today. 
I don't hide what I went through. My five years of, of going through dialysis, here I am today. And I'm very grateful, I'm very thankful for that. Because here I am today, resilient in my faith. You see, life, it is a rough, it is a tough fighter. It beats up on us. But the one thing life don't understand is that we are tougher than it. I want you to hear that today. You may be being beat up right now by life. But I want you to hear today, I want you to know it, and I want you to believe it in your hearts today, that you are tougher than any punch that life can throw at you. You can handle it. You can take it. You can take all that life can dish out at you. Now, many of us, we don't think of ourselves in this light. But I want you to know that your resilience has made you a tough fighter and that you can win your fight especially all of us whose trust is in the Lord. Now, for those that don't understand our resilience today, I want to quickly share a verse here with you, a couple of verses here with you from the 17th chapter of Jeremiah. In the 7th and in the 8th verse, the Lord shared a word with Jeremiah that speaks to our resilience there in the 17th chapter of Jeremiah, the 7th and the 8th verse, you'll see the Lord said, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. The Lord said, For he shall be like a tree planted by waters. And listen to this. Listen to this tree here that the Lord describes. Said that this tree that is planted by the water it spreads out its roots by the river and it will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Look at that tree, this old mighty and resilient tree here. This tree had an endless supply of water. Therefore, this tree, it had an endless supply of strength. It had an endless supply of life. This tree, it could handle the worst that life could throw at it. Look at that tree there. In the 17th chapter of Jeremiah, the 7th and the 8th verse. In heat and in drought, the Lord said that this tree could handle it. It could handle the worst conditions that life would throw its way. Do you understand that you are built by your faith to handle the worst that life can throw at you? Life can throw its worst at you, but I want you to understand, I want you to know today that you built different, that you can handle all that life throws at you. You see, Paul, he was not some big, he was not some mighty man, physically speaking. Paul would even tell you that he had many afflictions and, and Paul, he would tell you that he felt weak as well. However, spiritually speaking, Paul was a very strong man in the faith. Paul, he had the strength to stand before councils that hated him. Paul, he had the strength to be able to endure and to persevere through all of his afflictions and all of those that would persecute him, that would pursue him everywhere he went, everywhere he turned and everywhere he would go. And again, I tell you today that all of us, you yourself, you have that same resilience today. You have that same strength. So I feel like we need to look at this strength here for a moment the strength that Paul had, because we too have this strength. So again, someone may ask, well, what was it that gave Paul the strength to be able to endure? What gave him the strength to be able to persevere in his fight? Paul's strength came from his faith in the Lord, of course. But in that faith, the Lord, he gave Paul two sources of strength, two sources of strength that exist to all of us today. 
But in my message today, I want to focus on one of those sources and I'll get to that next source in next week's sermon. So let's focus on one of the sources of Paul's strength here today. I believe when we look at our key verses for today, and we look at the fact that Paul was talking about being hard pressed when he was talking about being perplexed, when he was talking about being uh, persecuted and struck down there, there was something that Paul had that allowed him to continue to push forward and to move forward in his life. The something that I believe Paul had that he understood he had was the fact that he had peace. Paul had peace of mind where others would fret, where others would be frantic, where others would worry, where others would be anxious. Paul, he had peace and he understood the peace that he had obtained with himself. And you see that peace that he had within was a source of his strength to be able to endure and to be able to persevere. You see, again, Paul, he moved with a sense of calm. He moved in that sense of peace when trouble was on every side. And again, I would wonder, and I would ask of you today, when trouble is on every side, are you at calm and are you at peace? Are you digging into your source of strength to be able to endure and to be able to persevere today. You see, Paul, he he knew the great difficulty that he was going to face on his missionary journeys. But Paul, he could write to the Philippians while he was in prison. He could say to them, the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. You see, Paul, he again was at peace when he wrote that. Paul, again, even at the end of his life from that place of peace, he could write and he could say to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Most importantly, Paul said, I have kept the faith. You see trouble was on every side, but, but Paul was saying to Timothy, those troubles, they didn't get to me. They didn't win. Paul said, I won the fight. Paul said, I kept the faith. You see, he was focused even at the end of his life when he should have been worrying about his life. He wasn't worrying because again, he was digging from that source of strength. He was digging from that peace that he had attained that peace, which is not given by the world, that peace, which is given by Christ in order for us to be able to endure when trouble is on every side, we must come to understand this source of strength. Because again, I want you to understand that we have it today. We must come to understand our peace so that we can rely on it when we are hard pressed on every side, when trouble is everywhere that we go. So to understand this source of strength, we must first understand where our peace came from. The peace that is available to everyone to attain. Again, it is a peace that is not given by the world. It is a peace that is given by the Lord through his only begotten son. As we have learned recently in our Sunday school lessons, God gave his only begotten son to restore harmony between himself and us, mankind. He gave his only begotten son to reconcile the world unto himself. He gave his only begotten son to give us true rest in our soul. And again, that rest, that is contentment in our soul. That is peace. In our soul, Jesus, he said to all of us, his disciples, peace, I leave with you. My peace, Jesus said, not somebody else peace. Jesus said, my peace, I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. The world can't give the peace of Christ. 
only Christ can, can give us that peace. You see, without Christ giving us that peace, without Christ restoring harmony between mankind and the Lord, we would never have been able to experience true peace. We wouldn't have it today. And you see, without peace of mind, we would be lost. Without peace of mind, we would be exhausted from stress. Without peace of mind, we will be crushed and we would have been destroyed by life. So again, peace, it is something that we ought to be trying to attain today if we haven't already done so. We should be trying to do this so that we can endure, so that we can persevere through life, so that we can withstand the blows that life tries to deal to us today. Now, while peace is available to everyone, I want all of those who do not have that peace today or those who may not understand that peace today, I want everybody to know what it is that we had to go through so that they can understand what they have to go through in order to be able to obtain, to attain that peace. Because when, when we can understand what it is that we went through to get that peace, we can then understand our source of strength and then rely on that source of strength. So let's look at this for a moment here. We who are at peace, we had to fight for that peace. I don't know if you realize that today. Getting that peace, it wasn't easy. It certainly wasn't easy for me. I had to fight for my peace. Did you have to fight for your peace today? See, because I had to fight for that peace, I, I now treasure it. So let's look at this fight here. I want to explain this fight so that others can understand this fight. And so maybe you can understand this fight as well. When it came to attaining Jesus's peace, the very first step that, that we had to take was to seek forgiveness from the Lord. Some will say, oh, well, that sounds easy. All I have to do is go to God and ask for forgiveness. But I tell you something, seeking forgiveness from God, it ain't easy. It ain't easy. It's, 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 it's rather difficult to, to go out and, and to seek forgiveness from the Lord. Let me explain that for a moment here. You see, forgiveness, it, it called for us to first have to heed God's rebuke. And again, as I said in that sermon that I preach, when somebody tells you that you have done wrong, that ain't something that you want to hear. Nobody ever wants to hear that they have done wrong. Nobody ever wants to hear that they have been disobedient. Nobody wants to hear that because, again, all of us believe that we have done right and that we are living right. There are many of us who believe that we are perfect. Well, we are perfect. Nobody wants to hear that they ain't perfect. Tell me I'm wrong. See, forgiveness, it, it, it called for us to then acknowledge that we have done wrong. And guess what? That ain't easy either. Don't nobody want to admit that they have done wrong. Tell me that I'm wrong. Sister Lauren said, so true, preacher. Don't nobody, don't nobody want to do it. Imagine yourself having to go up to somebody saying, hey, man, I did wrong. You was right. Don't nobody want to do that. There are many people who hold off on years from ever doing that. Some people go to the grave without going and letting somebody know, hey, you was wrong. Or I was wrong and you was right. Forgiveness, it calls for us to not only acknowledge that, but it calls for us to confess it. That's what John wrote in his first epistle. He said that we must confess the error of our way to the Lord. How many of us are doing that today? How many of us are actually going and telling God that, hey, you was right and I was wrong and this is how I did wrong today? Again, forgiveness. Some will say, oh, that's easy. All I have to do is go and say, hey, Lord, forgive me. But it is a whole lot more to it. It is a whole lot more difficult than that. You see, in order to acknowledge, in order for us to confess that we have done wrong, we have to first lower ourselves. That requires us to let go of a couple of things. It requires us to let go of our ego. 
It requires us to let go of our pride in order for us to then humble ourselves to be able to even acknowledge and, and to confess that we have done wrongly. See the person of ego, the person of pride, they ain't going to never be able to admit that they have done wrong because they cannot humble themselves. Lastly, forgiveness, it calls for us to then turn away from the error, to turn away from our disobedience, to completely let go of that way and to then walk in a new way. When it comes to God, this requires us to let go of our wickedness and to then commit ourselves to the way of God. And again, I tell you, that ain't an easy thing to do. Yeah, and I want to remind all of you that this is simply the first step in trying to attain peace, the peace that is of Christ himself. You see, the bell rings in that fight for peace and the next round begins. And that next round in boxing, it don't get any easier because you have taken some punches. You have taken some blows to the body, to the head. And now you got to continue to push on forward. And, 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 and we find in this next round, when we are trying to attain the peace that is of Christ, that we are facing our biggest enemy, our greatest enemy, and some of us believe that our greatest enemy is the devil. And yes, he is a, a great adversary of ours. But I would tell you today that there is even a bigger enemy than the devil. And that enemy is yourself. We are our biggest enemy when it comes to trying to attain peace. You see, in the next round after we have been forgiven by God and we have committed ourselves to his way, we find ourselves at war within. There is a war that is taking place within us as we have seen in a recent Sunday school lesson, last week's lesson, by the way. This war that is taking place within us is between the two contra contrary natures that dwells in us. The nature, of course, that is of the flesh, that nature that, again, we once lived in, that we would say is our old self, our old man. And then the other nature is the new man that the Holy Spirit is transforming us into. This nature is the nature that is of the spirit. And we find that the nature of the flesh and the nature of the spirit is doing this constantly fighting against one another. You see, the, na the nature that is of the flesh, it has a grand desire to live for itself, to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And, and we find in this nature, as we know very well, that this nature it is a nature that lives in total opposition against the Lord. It is a nature that is of wickedness. It is a nature of sin. And we find that when we have committed ourselves to living in the way of God, that our old man continues to do this. Hey. We think that we don't put the old man behind us. We think that we don't put our old ways behind us. An old man continues to do this every now and then, saying, hey, stop doing that. Let's go have some fun doing what we used to do. How many of us give in and we go, hey, yeah, let's go and have fun like we used to do. And then the whole time we have the nature of the spirit residing in us, having to fight old man off, say, hey, don't listen. Don't listen to old man. That way ain't no good for you. There's a better way for you to go. You know this because you committed yourself to it. Stick with me. Stick with the way that is of God. This nature is, again, nature that is being guided by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, that nature, it desires to live for the Lord. 
It desires for us to live not wickedly. It desires for us to live righteously in harmony with the Lord. In other words, the nature that is of the spirit desires for us to live in peace. While the nature that is of the flesh is just trying to raise up a whole bunch of hell. Part of my language. And so the end result is these two natures going back and forth. A fight, a war is taking place within us. And as I said all of last month, in order for us to win that fight, we must choose God over everything. We must heed his rebuke. We must learn to then lean on him if we truly want to have his peace within us. You see, if we want to win that internal fight, that internal struggle that we are having, we have to depend on the Holy Spirit so that we can win that fight. Do you want to win that fight today? Do you truly want to have peace today? You see, I want you to know about this fight for peace today. Again, I wanted you to know this so that you can understand the peace that you have attained. I want you to know how hard that you had to fight for that peace today. You see, many people don't know how hard you had to fight for the peace of mind that you have today. You see, many people don't understand the hills that you had to walk up in order for you to attain that peace. Many people don't understand the mountains that you had to climb in order for you to attain that peace. Many people don't know the valleys that you had to walk through in order for you to attain that peace. Many people don't understand that you had to go through a wilderness to attain the peace that you have today. But again, I tell you, because you fought your greatest enemy, and you won that fight today, I tell you today that you gained that peace. And I tell you today, because you have gained that peace, because you have fought that fight, you have the strength to take on and to defeat anything that stands in your path. If you have beat yourself, that old man, in order to have peace of mind, I want you to know today, you can beat anything. You can withstand anything. And see, we, we know, we know those that stand in opposition to us, don't we? Those that are trying to wreck and ruin and destroy us by taking away our peace. You see, we remember what Paul said to the Ephesians. We remember that Paul said that we face principalities, that we face powers, that we face rulers of darkness and spiritual hosts of wickedness, even in heavenly places. Everywhere we turn, there is trouble. We remember what Paul said. Satan, again, as we know, does not want any of us to have peace of mind. Satan, again, we know, will use any method that he can to wreck, to corrupt, and to destroy us. We know that very well. You see, Satan, I want you to know today, Satan knows that your biggest enemy, your worst enemy, is you. And so he will try to use you against yourself to beat you. However, this again is why I shared that internal struggle that we have. This is why I shared with you that fight for peace that we have that takes place within us. Because again, I tell you that if we could beat ourselves before in order to attain peace, we can do it again and again and again. No matter how often Satan tries to use us against ourselves. So again, this is why it is vitally important that we understand that, that source of strength that we have when it comes to our peace of mind. This is why we ought not let go of it for anything. 
You see, when Satan can't beat us by using ourselves, he will go the external route to defeat us, to, to knock us out. As Paul was antagonized everywhere he went, we again know very well that we are antagonized everywhere that we go. See, I'm again reminded of how Satan tempted Jesus and how he tried to absolutely destroy Job externally. That's how Satan tries to attack us. You see, attack, Satan attacked both of them on every side, but they were able to withstand it. They were able to withstand it because they held on to their peace and they kept the faith. You can withstand everything that goes against you today again if you hold on to your peace and you keep the faith. Will you do that today? You see, with trouble on every side, Paul, he encouraged the Corinthians to not lose heart or let go of hope. Again, this was a man that understood holding on to the peace that you have within because peace keeps us focused on heaven. It keeps us focused on the Lord. And when the believer remains focused, the believer again cannot be beat. Do you hear me here today? Paul said to the Corinthians, though the outward man is perishing, he said that in the 16th verse, the inward man is renewed day by day. You are strengthened. Remember that tree of Jeremiah, the endless supply of life that it had by the river. We are by a river today. That river is flowing with life, life that is given to us, not by the world, but by the Lord. In the 40th chapter of Isaiah and the 31st verse, the Lord said that he will renew the strength of all of those that wait on him. He said that we will mount up with wings like eagles. We will run and not grow weary. We will walk and we will not faint. In other words, by God, we can make it. By God, you can keep the faith. By God, nothing can disturb your peace. By God, you will be resilient when there's trouble on every side. Again, another enemy we face is life itself. Everywhere we turn, again, we know that there's trouble. But again, as Paul shared with the Corinthians, we can make it. Paul said he was weak because he had a thorn in the flesh. But the Lord told Paul that in his weakness, that his love was sufficient. That in his weakness, God said that his strength was made perfect. We may think that our afflictions make us weak, but I tell us today that in your afflictions, when you are feeling that you are at your weakest, you are actually at your strongest today. See again, this is life trying to make us feel weak. We often feel that our afflictions, whether they are mental, whether they are, again, physical, emotional, whether it is illness or disability, whether it is age itself, we begin to feel like we are weak at times. But again, I want you to know and I want you to understand today, you ain't weak, not by a long shot. You are not weak. Hold on to your faith. Keep your peace today. Again, I encourage you to, to continue to stand on your faith in the Lord today. And again, when you stand on that faith and when you hold on to your peace, you will make it. You will be resilient and you will win this fight. Amen. 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 Amen.